Good morning. I've always loved learning about mythology, specifically about ancient Greek, Roman, and Norse pantheons. When I was younger, I was shocked to find out that English words were sometimes based off these ancient gods' names. For instance, Thor lent his name to Thor's day. March and Mars, the planet, was named for Mars, the Roman god of war. And the month of January was named for a god I previously never heard of, Janus, the Roman god of transitions, doorways, and gates. His physical depiction was a little unusual as he was often drawn as a figure with two heads, each facing the opposite direction, one facing forward, the other facing backward. This was in reference to how he could view the past and use, it, use that to make predictions on the, how the future would go for the mortals who asked him for help in their decisions. I think that would be a useful skill to have to simultaneously learn where you've been and to look forward to the future. Thinking about the future sometimes comes with a lot of anxiety. Knowing where you've been and how you've managed to get there can help with that and vice versa. Looking at the past sometimes produces a feeling of regret. The future may solve that. You may get the chance to fix some problems of the past. I also like to look at communion in both ways. Communion looks back at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By taking communion, we are accepting his death as an atonement for our sins. We are saying with this ritual, our sins are forgiven, and we are now children of God. We are not saying we are the perfect ones, because we need to examine ourselves, but we are forgiven. We are also proclaiming his death. This tells us two things. First, it is Christ's accomplishment, not our own. We are saved by grace, not cooperation. Second, we proclaim it, announce it to the world. If someone asks you why you do it, you should be able to explain it. Then, communion looks forward as we repeat this ritual until he comes. That implies that we believe Christ is coming back, as was prophesied. He is coming back, which has two implications. First, there will be a time of judgment. Justice is coming, both as punishment and as a reward for those who have done what is right. Second, in some ways that aren't completely understood by us, there will be a new heaven and earth. The curse of sin will be lifted, death will cease, and a new order of things will come. In short, we know the ending of the story. God wins. And by taking the bread and the juice, we declare all of what I said is true. Gentlemen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today to break bread together. We thank you for your son's sacrifice so that we can break bread with you in heaven someday. As we look back, help us always proclaim Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection so that we can never forget it. As we look forward, help us be prepared for when Jesus does return so that we can join in the celebration. Please bless this communion to our souls so our spirits can be all the stronger. In Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this bread, when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you reclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
As Gino always said, coming to offering, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure, measure you use, it will be measured to you. Luke 6, 38. And as Gino also always said, God loves a cheerful giver. And every time I find a story about an old couple, it always reminds me of grandma and grandpa, so think of them as I read this story. A man and a woman had been married for more than 60 years. They had shared everything. They had talked about everything. And they kept no secrets from each other, except the little old woman had a shoebox in the top of her closet that she had cautioned her husband never to open or to ask her about. For all these years, he had never thought about the box, but one day, the little old woman got very sick, and the doctor said she would not recover. In trying to sort out their affairs, the little old man took down the shoebox and took it to his wife's bedside. She agreed that it was time that he should was in the box. When he opened it, he found two crocheted dolls and a stack of money totaling $95,000. He asked her about the contents. When we were married, she said, my grandmother told me the secret of a happy marriage was to never argue. She told me that if I ever got angry with you, I should just keep quiet and crochet a doll. The little ma old man was so moved, he had to fight back tears. Only two precious dolls were in the box. She had only been angry with him two times in all those years of living and loving. He almost burst with happiness. Honey, he said, that explains the dolls, but what about all this money? Where did that come from? Oh, she said, that's the money I've made selling the dolls. <laughs> <laughs> Bow with me in offering prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you again, this time as cheerful givers, to help spread your kingdom throughout the community and throughout the world. We ask that you bless these ties about to be given so that they are used as best as they can. Please keep us safe as we travel throughout the week so we can meet here again safely next week. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, again, we just want to welcome everybody here because it is nice and toasty warm in here as we're in the heart of winter. For you that love the cold, well, here it is. But we're going to continue our series in the month of January calling in on ho odd holidays throughout this month. And on January 10th, last Monday, it was called Peculiar People Day. Now, nobody knows who came up with this idea of making this such a special day to honor peculiar people. Someone said that Hallmark just needed to find another way to sell more cards, and maybe that's the reason. But the whole idea behind Peculiar People Day is to celebrate those who are eccentric, nonconformist, or otherwise unique in some way. And I was reading some of these things and some of the ways that you can celebrate this holiday is maybe go to the hair salon and have them dye your hair all kind of different colors pink blue or whatever to show how unique you are some say another way to honor this day is as you go in the grocery store put those ear pods in and just dance away up and down the aisle some say just cook something strange peculiar for your family that day just to see if they're going to eat it. Now for me, I never heard of this holiday until I was doing these things, but I am sure that I've done many, many peculiar things in my life. I mean, a lot of peculiar things in my life. And I was thinking about this, and I remember one time, way back before we were married or anything, I was flying from Florida to Michigan, I forget the name of the airlines, but wherever you flew from, it always flew into Newark, New Jersey. 
And so it was in December or January. I don't know when it was. But there was a blizzard going, snowing. And of course, you know me. I'm in shorts. And to get off the airplane, to go down the ladder into the tarmac. And there's all these people standing there. And as soon as I got off and I got there, I held my hands up and I went, Puerto Rico, here I am. And the look in everybody's face goes, you're not, sir, 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 you're not in Puerto Rico. Yes, I am, because that's what my ticket says. But it's awful cold here, and I'm not getting it. And walked away, and you could hear people going, what is wrong with that man? <laughs> now, the thing that I like is that I know for my wife, I've embarrassed her so, so many times. But I'm proud of my children because they kind of fall into the same thing as me. I could start something and they would just flow with it. And so I'm glad to say that sometimes they're like their father. But as I looked at this security, I realized that I'm kind of like my father. Now, I don't know if you remember my dad or not. And as I was going through all the peculiar things he did in his life, and there was a lot, but the one that sticks out was one day him and Chuck Yannicka, if you know Chuck, him and my dad were good friends. And it was probably mid-January, and there was the ice flow going down the river. And so they got their wetsuits on, got a t table, car table, set it on the ice, got two chairs, and act like they were playing cards floating down the ice in the middle of the winter. And, of course, the phone calls, and then they realized the Coast Guard was going to come in until they realized who it was, and they just let them go. <laughs> But all in all, the idea of a peculiar people day is that peculiar people in question are those who are odd or weird in some fashion. In essence, we're all kind of weird in a little way. But that's not what the word originally meant, if you think about it. The word peculiar originally came from the Latin. And what it basically means is private property. Now... In the old King James, and we're going to be, I'm going to be using some King James Version here today, is that they use this word as private property. But in the King, King James Version, how they interpret private property was that you are a treasured possession that belonged to God. And for the English-speaking people of that day, peculiar didn't mean something that was strange or bizarre, they understood to be talking about something that was so special to God. For example, we read in Deuteronomy out of the King James Version, Thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself, above all the nations that are upon the earth. In other words, God is saying he owns Israel. He's saying that they are a special treasured possession. In fact, they were so special to God that no one could touch them unless God said they could. They are under his exclusive protection. And this is almost exactly what was declared in Psalms. It said, for the Lord had chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Now, that's so intriguing, is that God says the same thing about us. That we are special to him. That we are his peculiar treasure. And as you see in 1 Peter, God declares, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's saying that we are peculiar. And why we are? Because we're special to him. And because of that, we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. And we've been called out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Now notice, this is what God did for us. We didn't deserve to be honored like this. You did not. You could not. I could not do enough good deeds to buy God's approval. 
But this is what Ephesians tells us before you became a Christian. It said, we're by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incom incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by work so that no one can boast. We were all once lost in our own transgressions. You had absolutely nothing to offer God. And we need to remember, you did not earn your salvation because it's unearned, it's unmerited, it is undeserved, but that salvation is a free gift from God. The only thing you ever did that qualified you for God's mercy and his forgiveness was that you acknowledged that you didn't deserve it to begin with. And if you were smart enough to humble yourself before his throne and accept Jesus Christ for this belief, then you ask for the repentance of your sins. You confess that Jesus was now going to be your Lord and Savior. And by allowing yourself to be buried in the waters of baptism and rise up a new creature in Jesus Christ, a Christian comedian once said, the only reason I'm a Christian because it's the only religion that will accept me. And that's right. Jesus is the only Savior who would have folks like you and me. You ask, but why? Why would God forgive us? Why would God want us? Why would God do this? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's because of this. It's because God loves us so much. It's because we accepted him on his terms. We cannot accept God on our terms. We need to accept him on his terms. And because of that, God has made us a peculiar possession. Do you notice that one phrase that was in 1 Peter 2.9? It says, a holy nation peculiar person a holy nation the question is what does that word holy mean I mean this is not some deep theological term this is not something that you need to go years and years of college to figure out what holy is it's a very basic word and it just means to separate or to set apart the people in the sound booth back there are holy because they're separated from us right now. The women who sang today did a tremendous job. They are holy because they are up here and they are separated from you today. Joey did a tremendous job with the meditation and he was holy because he was separated from you. I, up here today, am separated from you today. Anything that is set apart from something else is holy. And in the scripture, the word means you were set apart by God. You have and I have been set aside from the rest of the world to be God's treasured possession. We are a holy people and because of that we have a specific purpose. We are peculiar. In our present day language sometimes when you hear that word peculiar the first thing that pops in your mind is they're different. They're not normal. And in a sense, we're not normal. We're not like everybody else when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God has set us apart to be different than the rest of the world because God has called us to be different than the world. God made us holy. But the Bible says this. We are to make ourselves holy as well. Peter said, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. God calls us to be holy. He calls us to be different than the rest of the world. He calls us not to be normal, but to be 
peculiar. What was read today in Titus, it said, God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-control, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And why? It's a question. Why do we need to live this way? What's the purpose for us to live this way? As we read further, it says, because he gave himself up for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. God gave himself up for us so we might be purified and become holy, to become different, to become peculiar. Now, is it a bad thing to be different? Is it a bad thing to be peculiar? Well, when I thought about that, I go back to my school days. How awful it was if you were peculiar in junior high or high school. You didn't want to be different because people would make fun of you. You didn't want to be different because people would tease you. And maybe some of you went through that in school. And for some, you're thinking, man, I hated high school. Or I hated these things because I was pointed out or made fun of. And many people still today shy away because of what happened in school. But being different is not always a bad thing. It's how we look at it. For example, has anybody ever been to Arlington National Cemetery? If you haven't, it's it's it blows your mind. I've been there a few times. It's just outside Washington DC and it's an honor to be buried there and a lot of very important people are buried there. Some of our greatest heroes are buried there. And do you know what is the coolest event if you ever go? You have to see if you're in Arlington National Cemetery. Is go to the tomb of the unknown soldiers and watch the changing of the guards. Being a guard at that tomb is regarded one of the highest honors. Not everyone gets to be that position. You just don't raise your hand at a point and you get to do this. Only 10% of the applicants who pass this rigorous test, which means several, several hundreds of hours of practicing marching, rifle drill, how your uniform has to look perfect. And you're also supposed to know where people are buried. You need to know the history of the cemetery. You need to know all this information. A guard normally will serve between one and one and a half years. Every sentry who gets this job gets a badge that he wears with honor. This badge is given to them. And this, the men who guard this post are held in such high standard that if they ever do anything that is deemed unworthy of unbecoming a tomb guard that brings dishonor to them, the army, or this tomb in particular, these badges can be taken away. I mean, that's how important this is. These soldiers are different. These soldiers are distinctive. They are literally peculiar because they've been set apart for this special honor in this special cemetery. And that's what God has done for us. This is what God is asking us. We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. And we've been called out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And so God says, because I've given you this great honor, you need to live holy lives. You need to be different than what the world asks and is doing around us. We need to say no to ungodliness. We need to be careful of our worldly possessions. Paul tells Peter that there'll be people out there that we have to be careful of. People of lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. It's almost like you're describing what's going on in the United States now. How many times you just hear these things and you watch things and go, these people don't care about anything but themselves. All they care about is money and we have to be careful. Paul tells Ryan Timothy, you have to be careful. Have nothing to do with them. 
And the question is why? Because you, us, are called to live differently than that. You are called to live a holy life. In fact, Peter says, live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, why should we live that kind of life? Because the verse tells us one very important thing. It tells us we need to glorify God. Do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus told us, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. We live holy lives not because we're just nice people. We live holy lives not because we're better than everyone else. No, we live holy lives because it's going to glorify God. That's our purpose. We live a holy life to make sure we're glorifying God. Our righteous deeds aren't done because we're more righteous than everybody else, but because that God we serve is better than anything this world can offer. And we love Him so much that we want to bring others to love Him as much as we love Him. Think about this. We are a chosen generation. You and I are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. And they talk about being holy. Another word for holy is sacred. I was reading about a preacher whose name was Rubel Shelley who made this observation. I thought, this is pretty cool. And he said, centuries ago, someone beginning to spread the false idea that the Christian life is to be understood in two terms. You have your Christian life that's secular, and you have your Christian life that is sacred. And he said, a sac sacred places were places like the church. Sacred events could be maybe a worship service, or a baptism, or maybe a wedding. Sacred people were preachers, or church officials, elders, and deacons, and Sunday school teachers. The remainder of life he declared, was now secular. So your home and farm and your stores and schools, they were secular places. Surgery, manufacturing, accounting, teaching, driving, watching TV were all labeled as just being secular. Ordinary people doing ordinary things like shopping and eating were secular. This is another way to understand this. If you believe that the moment we leave this building, nothing is sacred anymore. Once you get into your car and leave church and go back to being, quote, normal again, we don't have to worry about being sacred. We're back to the secular world. But the question is, are you normal? No, you're not. You're in the church building now and you're saying, okay, I'm sacred in here. I feel sacred because I'm in a sacred building, and therefore I feel sacred. But as soon as I step out that door, forget that noise, I'm back to the secular world. A lot of you people go to the restaurant after service. Now you can just be mean to the waitress because it doesn't matter because you're not in church. I'm out there in the secular world, so therefore I can live secular. When you go home, argue with your wife. Yell at the kids. Kick your dog. It's okay because now you're in the secular world. When you go to work, or school, or to the store, why do I have to act like I'm here? Because I'm not here. I'm out there, so therefore I should act like I am out there. And that's not true. And you know that's not true. Do you realize, do you realize that the only thing that makes this building sacred is you? You! The believers of Jesus Christ, you're the ones who makes this building sacred. We can sell this building tomorrow and it can be used for anything else because it's just a building. I don't you know if you've ever been to Pontiac, there was that church that was changed to clutch cargoes. Now it's kind of a bar, nightclub kind of a place. Now, I don't think the beer they serve in that place is sacred because it was a sacred building. 
two doors down, really. There was a church. Now somebody bought it as their home. So as they're in their home, because it used to be a church, that everything they do in there is sacred, their meals are sacred, the TV programs they watch is sacred. The Methodist Church in Marine City has been sold. And they sell furniture. Is that sacred furniture because it was sold from an old church? I don't think so. It's not the building, it's the people who come into the building. The moment you go home, your home is sacred. The moment you go to a restaurant, the restaurant is sacred. The moment you go to work on Monday, that workplace you go to becomes sacred. Every place you go becomes sacred. And I'll tell you why. Because you're a holy people. You are a peculiar possession for God. The Holy Spirit resides inside you, and God goes wherever you go. Paul writes, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit lives in you? Think about that. I've been thinking, you know, a lot of places I'd like to go, I get bucket lists, and one of the places... I think would be pretty interesting to go would be the, to Jerusalem, to Israel. And of course we know when we talk about Israel, they call it what? The Holy Land. And the reason they do that is because the land of Israel is such a special piece of property where God did a lot of cool things throughout the history if you read the Bible. But you need to realize that the place where you sit right now where you are sitting is so much more holier than Jerusalem. Why? Because you are sitting there. You are the holy ones. You have the Holy Spirit residing within you. And because of that, you are a holy person. Yes, I, would, I wouldn't go to Israel just because some shining light would come on me. And ever since that day, people go, wow, there's something different about you. Yes. I've been to the Holy Lands. I know I don't see John. I know John Benedict went to the Holy Lands. I don't see a light shining on him. Or if anybody else in here has been there. But that's not how it works. I would go just because of the history. Not only Bible history, but because I'm a history major. And how cool it would be to go there. I would love to go there because there's something in my bucket list that says i got to swim wherever I go. <laughs> I've swam in the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Caribbean all the Great Lakes. I swam in the St. Lawrence River. I swam in the Mississippi River. Not really. I got about this deep in the Mississippi River and I just couldn't get myself to get under it because it was so smelly. And, but I waded in the Mississippi River. And of course, I've showed you this picture. Yes, I jumped in the Crater Lake because I had to, because it was there. Not because my daughter pushed me. <laughs> but I want to swim in the Sea of Galilee. How cool would that be? I would love to swim in the Jordan River. How neat would that be? I'd love to go to the Dead Sea and just float around because they say it's hard to sink because it's so much salt in it. You just float. I would love to walk where Jesus walked. I'd love to walk Jerusalem. I'd love to walk in those areas. I think that would be so interesting. But I want you to think about that. There are Christians who are in Jerusalem right now that are more holy than what the land is. There's people who live there who are Christians they are more holy than just this city itself. As Christians, we need to understand everywhere we go becomes sacred. Everything that you touch is touched by a holy person. Everything you say, and think about this, is a holy word. I want you to think about this. Lately, it seems that we are getting more and more confused of what church is and what it actually is. So I want to get some things straight here as we talk about the church. Because the church is not a building, though a building can be used by a church. A church is not a denomination, though a set of basic beliefs is very important to a church. 
A church is not about Sunday or Wednesday, which is important, though a church could not forsake that we need to meet together because we need to meet together. Church is not about one person or one personality, though every church needs to be pastored. And a church is not about size or growth, though every church is called to make disciples. So don't think of church as an address. Don't think of church as a location, but rather think of church as a mobile unit that is on the move. Don't think of church as something built, but think of a church as people in it who are now deployed to go out and teach the word. Don't think of church as where you are for an hour each week, but rather what you are every day, every minute. Because the church is the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Feet that can't and won't stay still. Hands that need to be moving and not idle. Feet do. Hands do. This is the church. Church isn't what you're sitting in right now. You are the church. And because we are the church, I want to close today with, again, I've been throwing resolutions at you. Let me continue to do so for 2022. I threw at you to find a way to do something because you are the church. We need to wake up and remember, it's not I've got to do this, it's I get to do this. Because you're the church, you need to rejoice in who you are. You need to rejoice in what Christ has done for you. You need to rejoice that God says, I'm going to give you another day. And I'm going to rejoice in that. I want to feel God. I want to rejoice in God. I want to share God because I get to do this. The second one. As Philippians says, having the same attitude as Jesus Christ. To get up and say, I'm going to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for the same attitude as Jesus Christ. I want to share his love. I want to share his patience. I want to share his forgiveness. I need that attitude. And the last one. We need to go and be the church. We need to go and be the church. We need to go out there, not because of us or anything, but we go out there because we want to glorify God. That's our mission. That's what we need to see. That this is what God is saying. I made you a peculiar people because I love you. I made you a peculiar people because I sent my son to die for you. I made you a peculiar people because I know you're the ones who are going to spread the word. I made you a peculiar people because you are different. You're going to live different and people are going to see the difference in how you live. That's what's important. This is what God is telling us. That we're a peculiar people because we are a special treasure to him. We're an honored treasure of his. He said, now go. Go and preach that word. Go walk the talk. Show people how different we are and how it is a different life. A life that makes sense. In all this confusion that's going on, God is saying, we got this. We got this. And people are going to go, I don't know what you got. Well, let me explain what I got. And I'll tell you why I'm peculiar. I'm going to tell you why I got a smile on my face. I'm going to tell you why I don't worry about what's going to happen because of the promises that God has given me. I'm not going to worry about these things because... I have a trust in God because he has got a place for me. And so while I'm here, let me rejoice in that. Let me rejoice that someday I'm going to be with him. But in the meantime, I get to share his love, his mercy, and his grace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.